Hey folks, Malforan here, and today we're going to be covering Tinto Talks number five by Johan, covering how estates are going to work. Well, a brief overview anyway of how they're going to work in Project Caesar, aka EU5. And before we get into this, I will just say thank you for everyone who watched my video yesterday where I went through his previous responses to the last Tinto Talks, and that went down quite well. You guys seem to enjoy it. So what I'm going to say is every Wednesday, these Tinto Talks come out. What I'm going to do is on a Friday, I'm going to go through the kind of best responses by Johan or anyone else off that team and put a video together where we can discuss it, especially if there's some interesting information in there. Because it's kind of cool following the development, being able to chat to you folks and kind of discuss the development of EU5 as we get through to it. And as I say, the video did very well. So, you know, why not do it again with this week? So I'm going to be covering the estates today. And then on Friday, I'll go through Johan's responses. I will say there's already about three pages of responses by him. And I was thinking of just adding it onto the end of this video. But I want to give him another couple of days to make sure like all the responses are there that he wants to give. And then I'll do that quick summary video on Friday and we can be all caught up ready for the next week's Tinto Talks. But anyway, let's just get straight into it. And the first thing I'm actually going to call out isn't really part of the discussion today at all. It is the map, which you can see on the screen at the moment. They actually showed this as the header of the post. And I guess this is our first look at how the map will look like day to day in EU5. And it reminds me very much of Imperator Rome's map. Let me know what you think, if you agree or not. The saturation of the colors and how the borders look, it reminds me very much of Imperator Rome, which would make sense. Johan worked on that as well. Kind of makes sense maybe that at least at the moment it looks a little bit like that. We are obviously, what, like at least a year out from launch, so I'm sure we might see changes in the future. But I actually really like how this looks. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And then we have some more fantastic art. Looks like a French uh, monarch here in Versailles, maybe just before the revolution starts. But let's get into the meat of the post. As always, not super big, but it does give us some good information on how things are going to work. So the first thing they want to talk about is there are four estates in Project Caesar, which mostly map one to one to the social classes, nobility, clergy, burghers, and the commoners. And then obviously there is the crown as well, which represents the state itself. Each estate gains power based on the amount of population belonging to that estate, which is also modifiable by local attributes of where the population is, where some nobles might have very high power in a certain area, or whether a city has entrenched burger rights there. And as you can see, I mean, it's just the EU4 UI looking nice, isn't it? Let's be honest. And uh, I really like it. I really like the colours, actually. So the crown being purple, nobility blue, clergy white, grey, burgers a golden colour, and commoners, obviously. Commoners muck in brown. And I would imagine around the game, anything that affects these will be coloured in that colour. So you can kind of see, again, at a glance, what's going to be affected by different things. I would imagine that's how it's going to work. It would make sense. It would be really useful as well to have something like that. They've kind of started to bring that in in CK3 a little bit, so it wouldn't surprise me at all. And as they say here, this is the estate's part of the government view, where you can see their power, current satisfaction, the equilibrium trending towards, and what privileges it has. So this one showing the clergy being pretty powerful in this example. Every 1,000 nobles gives plus 50 estate power in their estate, while 1,000 peasants merely give 0.05 estate power as default. So yeah, those peasants, they're, they're not that powerful, are they? These then modified locally in each location, and then countrywide, these are affected by laws, reforms, and most notably the privileges that you've given each estate. The total power of all the four estates in the crown then together all add up to 100%, which is the effective power they have. So obviously the balance of that 100% showing who's really in charge. Depending on your crown power, you can either get a scaling penalty or a scaling bonus on aspects like the cost of revoking estate privileges, the cost of changing policies and laws, the effectiveness of your cabinet, the expected cost of the court, and then other things as well. I imagine there's a bunch of things this affects. If your crown power is weak, you will need to have the estates really satisfied or you will not get much out of any parliament you try and call, which is cool. If you are a parliamentary monarch, obviously you need the parliament being happy to generally get what you want. You know, if you are a God-given monarch, maybe you don't need to do quite as much to keep them on your side, obviously depending on how you play through your nation. Each of the four estates has a current satisfaction and an equilibrium it will move towards. Some estates and some countries will have the estate satisfaction move quicker to the equilibrium than others. Each estate has two factors per type of estate in which the satisfaction impacts the entire country. Where satisfaction is above 50%, it gives a scaling bonus, and below, a scaling penalty. Very much reminiscent of the EU4 mechanics around the different levels as well. So nothing too crazy, nothing too revolutionary of how the system's going to look. If satisfaction, though, goes below 25%, the estate will not provide any levies, so that's going to be bad. Most importantly, the estate satisfaction also impacts the satisfaction of the pops who belong to that estate possibly creating rebel factions and even civil wars. So you don't want to be getting any of these estates especially annoyed. Although I imagine some of them probably easier to deal with than others. What do these estates kind of do in general? So the nobility impacts your prestige gain and your counter-espionage. 
the clergy impacts your research speed and your diplomatic reputation. Burgers impact your merchant power and your production efficiency. And commoners impact your food production and their stability costs. So each one of these kind of ranks affects different things. And I think they map pretty well to historically what they generally did as well. It's cool to see already this early on which parts are going to be affected by what. So what impacts the satisfaction equilibrium of an estate? The privileges they get, the current stability, some reforms may impact them, some laws may, how you tax them, and much more. Some examples include clergy being happier with higher religious unity, or burghers liking having more market centres in your country. So again, you can kind of balance these out, again, like you can in EU4, where you can give things to these estates, it makes them happier with you or not, or makes them more powerful, etc. So again, kind of keeping that system, but it looks like maybe a refresh of it for EU5. Kind of all makes sense so far. So estate privileges then. You may feel forced to grant privileges to estates to be able to tax them more, and you may be forced to grant privileges to get their support in Parliament. All privileges impact the power of the estate, and many also increase the satisfaction at equilibrium. They all have some impact in gameplay fitting the privilege, and often they also impact a social value on their country. And the example we're given here is free mobility for peasants. Monthly progress to free subjects, 0.10 increase. Allow peasants to migrate, yes. Noble estate satisfaction and equilibrium, minus 10%. So this is obviously giving the peasants something to be happier about, but you're also giving them like concessions. You're also saying like, oh, you can become free subjects, and then you can also migrate somewhere else. So you're kind of balancing off whether you want to keep them happy get this thing out of them and are willing to give up something else. And obviously the noble estate's not quite as happy with you because you're giving the peasants kind of some power in a way, giving them a bit more free choice. So obviously the nobles, not, not down with that. They don't like people having choices, so not so happy with what you've done there. But again, this is something you're probably used to in EU4. There are many different privileges and many unique ones depending on where and what type of country you play. Although this is not the development diary where they're going to go into details about economic systems, it is important to mention that the estates of a country have wealth that is increased by the amount of money that you have not taken from them in taxes. Rich estates will use their wealth on many things, investing in things that benefit them, but also building things that will benefit the country. So yeah, I guess you don't want to like overtax them. Well, I guess if you need the money yourself, you might need to like very highly tax them to maybe pay for a war or something. But if you tax them less, if you can afford to, although they're going to build things for themselves, they are also going to invest, I guess, maybe into like... Uh, building upgrades maybe or something like that maybe help you increase how quick you're getting tech or something it does remind me a little bit of victoria 3 let me know in the comments i'll be honest i've not played a great deal of victoria 3 it kind of fell off that bandwagon relatively quickly but it does sound like roughly how this kind of thing works in there where you have like the private entities that kind of uh, can invest in things as well if they have money left over to spend i think anyway like i say let me know in the comments down below, but I believe that is roughly how it works in Victoria. And then that's it for the Tinto Talks on Estates. They do say next week they're going to go over a few new concepts that are new to the game and have not been seen in previous games. They'll also talk about proximity, control, and maritime presence, all concepts that we need to talk about in detail before they go into the economy system. So that sounds like a very interesting one. And what I will say is one of the responses from last week's Dev Diary which I didn't actually cover in that video yesterday, was talking about how like attrition works and how having large armies would work. And one of the comments that kind of caught my eye was, Johan was talking about how if you're England and you're prepared and you control the channel, is how he worded it, to get your armies over to Europe, you won't be affected by the changes they're doing in population and things like that because you're a very organized army and you can get there quickly. But I thought the phrasing of in control of the channel, I wonder if that's what we're going to be talking about next week with control and maritime presence i've got a feeling that maybe you can like not claim tiles in the sea but if you have a fleet there you're like the the policeman of that sector you're basically in charge of it think of how like the royal navy like ruled the seas for many many years for the english i wonder if we're going to get some kind of system like that where like if you are england you can like own the channel in a way not like directly like you don't have to go to war for it although maybe with fleets you can fight for it i guess but where you can like um, station fleets or have patrols maybe, and then that's seen as like, oh, that's English waters, and the French could come maybe destroy your fleet or get some kind of concessions at a peace deal, and then it would become maybe like French-controlled English Channel, and that would affect like trade. Maybe they got a cut of the trade going through those areas and things like that. Now, that's just all conjecture on my part. That could just be me on a wild goose chase on like some crazy theory I've just had. But it would be interesting, I think, if they brought in that kind of mechanic. Maybe if you 
didn't have it right at the beginning of the game either if you kind of like built up to it later on and you could have these big zone of control areas in the oceans and seas and things let me know what you think about that in the comments down below like i say it could just be a harebrained idea by me but i think it would be kind of interesting if you had it at least for a portion of the game but anyway on that note we're gonna leave it there for today as always hit that like button if you've enjoyed it subscribe if you're new here as i've said before i'm covering this game up to launch and beyond all the dev diaries all the news that we see and I'm bringing that new player or returning player vibe to it because I did see a comment in the last video saying like, it doesn't seem like you play EU4. Like, no, I haven't played it in about four years. So like some of these systems, I'm not going to know as much as some of you guys who are watching this video and are still playing the game day to day. There are going to be things I've missed, they've changed, or I've just forgotten. But that's really what this series is all about. It's kind of bringing new players into the game or bringing returning players into the game. And we're all going to learn the game together and then when it comes out, we can have a good time, have a good chat, and uh, see how we enjoy it at launch. Do subscribe if you've enjoyed it. I do cover Crusader Kings as well on the channel and other historical strategy games as well. But we'll leave it there for today, and I'll see you in the next one.